Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to God's house this morning as we celebrate the second Sunday of Easter. And since we are in the Sundays of Easter, it is good and right for us to continue to greet each other uh, with our Easter greetings. So hopefully you remember your part. Alleluia, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Really no pre-service announcements for us this morning. Our opening hymn is hymn 461, I Know That My Redeemer Lives.
beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We pause for silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocent bitterest sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our intro. We, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk of the Word. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. And with honey formed from the rock, I would satisfy you. Son of man, can these bones live? 
And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are clean, cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. Christ was crucified for us as our paschal lamb. God says, Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God says, Soon shall I subdue your enemies. Upon your adversaries I will turn my hand. Those that hate the Lord will submit to him, and so will their time be unto eternity. Hallelujah. Praise, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The epistle is from 1 John chapter 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the Alleluia and verse.
first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then he said, Then, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, O Lord, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
distancing after Jesus' death. They distanced themselves from the Jewish authorities. They hid behind locked doors. They were afraid not of a virus, but of those who had gotten Jesus crucified. Jesus said that the servant is not above his master, and if they killed Jesus, they would do the same to his disciples. By bearing the death of all sinners, Jesus had defeated death. He had risen from the dead. They should not have been afraid. Yet they were. He had risen. But it was not enough that Jesus rose from the dead. He had to appear to his disciples and give to them, and through them, to his holy church on earth, the power of the keys. He had promised that he would do this. And Jesus keeps his promises. First he rose from the dead. Christ's resurrection is God's absolution of the world. But the world does not know it or believe it. And so the world doesn't have it. Not even Christ's disciples knew of this absolution. First he rose from the dead. Then he gave the keys to his church. He did, in fact, rise. He was dead. His body was dead. The body that died is the same body that rose. It's not as if he had died in one body and rose as some sort of spiritual creature, as the Jehovah's Witnesses falsely teach. No, the same body that was nailed to the tree, the same body that died, is the body that rose. And the risen Lord showed the disciples the scars on his hands and his side, the marks that he suffered when he was crucified. It was the same body, the same Jesus. It was the same body, but a body changed. For 33 years, Jesus had humbled himself as he labored under the law to redeem those who are under the law. He had hid his glory under humility. In his human nature, he shared all of the characteristics and abilities of his divine nature. St. Paul writes, For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. During the time of his humiliation, however, he did not, in his human nature, always fully use all of the divine powers that his human nature shared. This was evidence on the cross. They mocked him, taunted him, told him to come down from the cross and save himself. Jesus certainly had the power to do so. But it was the Father's will that he drink up the cup of wrath all the way down to the bitter dregs. No one took our Lord's life from him. He gave it up of his own free will. He was able to come down from the cross. His love for his Father, his love for us, kept him there until all our salvation was accomplished. And for our salvation, he humbled himself and became a servant obedient unto death on the cross. But make no, no mistake, my friends, he is humbled no more. When he died, the humiliation was over. It is finished, he cried from the cross. His obedience was fully rendered before the bar of divine justice. The debt of this world's sin was fully paid. Satan's head lay crushed under his foot. His exaltation did not begin when he ascended into heaven. It began as soon as he died. Jesus, in his human nature, now always and fully uses all of the divine powers. He doesn't let things like locked doors stand in his way. The disciples were huddled in fear behind locked doors. And yet Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. He spoke to them. He didn't chide them for denying him. He said nothing about their cowardice, their lack of faith. No, he said, peace be with you. Peace is not simply a friendly greeting. It is a word of revelation from God the Father. It's no mere sentiment or wish. God's peace is a gift. It's a gift given in words. The words are the words of absolution. After saying peace to them, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, 
I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Where does Jesus get this authority? He won it. He faced the demands of God's law and fulfilled each and every one of them. He obeyed perfectly. The love that God's law requires of us was the love by which Jesus, our Lord, loved. He loved his own. He loved his enemies. His obedience was pure love. Love for his Father. Love for this fallen world, which includes you. He offered his perfect love to divine justice on behalf of the human race. And in doing so, he won the authority to forgive sins. Not only did he love in perfect obedience to God's law of love, he suffered the penalty for our failure to do so. He bore the punishment that we deserve. He was innocent and yet bore the sin of all sinners. He suffered for us in our place. He obeyed actively, loving with the purest of love. He obeyed passively, suffering with the most perfect patience. His resurrection from the grave is God's absolution to this world of sinners. But the forgiveness of sins wasn't enough. Forgiveness had to be given and received through faith. In other words, it has to be proclaimed. This is why Jesus came to his disciples on that first Easter evening. He came, came to give them what he had won by his passion. Let no Christian question the power of the keys. Jesus said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But Jesus also said, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus gave to his church on earth the keys of the kingdom. The forgiveness of sins unlocks the door to God's kingdom. On earth it is the kingdom of grace. In heaven it will be the kingdom of glory. The crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ rules over both kingdoms. He rules not with police, guns, prisons, courts, lawyers, armies, and such. But he rules with his Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Holy Spirit, God sets our hearts at peace. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He speaks the truth of God's law and his gospel. He speaks infallible words of forgiveness through fallible and sinful men like me. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus said. Everyone who has this Holy Spirit, every Christian, has received then from Jesus the authority to forgive and retain sins. God calls the pastor to do so publicly in the name of the church, but there's no special pastor power that doesn't belong to the whole church. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus said. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have the, for the authority to forgive sins. Jesus said, not only if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, but he did go on to say, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The forgiveness of sins is the key that frees sinners from their sins. We call this the loosing key. It unlocks the door to heaven. But a key works two ways. Not only does it unlock, but a key can also lock. The binding key locks the door to heaven. Can the church really lock people out of heaven? Yes. Jesus said, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Here is how we confess this biblical truth in our small catechism. What is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, 
receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. What do you believe according to these words, our catechism asks? I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular, when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain even in heaven, as if, our, as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. Thus ends our small catechism. We preach the gospel to sinners burdened by sin, who desire the forgiveness of sins, who want to live holy lives. We preach the law to sinners who cling to their sin, who refuse to repent. We don't spy out fellow Christians to try to find out what their secret sins are. Pastors must always assume that parishioners are living Christian life, lives. Who am I to judge? But if a sin is public, if it is obvious and clear, and if a sinner refuses to repent of it, it is the pastor's duty to tell the unrepentant sinner that his sins are retained, not forgiven, and exclude them from the kingdom of God. Not only must the pastor say this, but the church must say this with him. Yes, it is Jesus Christ who forgives repentant sinners. It is Christ himself who withholds forgiveness from unrepentant sinners. Jesus did not bear your sins so that you would have to bear them on your conscience. Have you stolen them? Have you cheated on a test? Have you lied about yourself? Have you loved your things more than you love your God? Have you misused his name to make yourself look good? Have you committed adultery? Have you had an abortion or paid for one? Have you lied about your neighbor and sullied his reputation? Have you hated your brother in your heart? Have you despised God's teaching, preferring your own wisdom and your own way to his? When you hold on to these sins, preferring them to receiving forgiveness, your sins are bound. They are unforgiven, and you are outside of the church, outside of God's kingdom. But the beauty is when you confess those sins, God forgives them. He doesn't forgive in part like we are apt to do. He forgives in full. He removes your sin from you as far as east is from west. He looks at you and doesn't see a sinner. He sees a saint. When Jesus forgives, even through the voice of his servant, he also gives you his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and he is the Spirit of peace, the Comforter, who enables us to pray. When we are kept from attending church services, we are not only shut out from God's absolution, we are not shut out from God's absolution. Every Christian may absolve another Christian in Jesus' name. Jesus sent the church's first pastors. He says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And Jesus has continued sending pastors for his church for the past 2,000 years. When a Christian congregation, in accordance with the word of God, calls a man to be her pastor and entrusts in him the public exercise of the keys, it is Jesus Christ himself who is sending that pastor. That means that the pastor must preach God's law both publicly and privately. He must absolve both publicly and privately. The law and the gospel are not my opinions. They are the words of Jesus, the church's head. He who bore all the sin of all sinners. He who rose from the dead free from the sins that he bore. He is the one that has all power in heaven and on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners and to retain those of the unrepentant as long as they don't repent. Jesus has chosen to speak his law and gospel through the mouth of his preachers, indeed through the mouth of all Christians. Every time you tell a friend, your sins are forgiven. Anytime you remind someone that Jesus died for them, 
That is exactly what you are doing. God's word, even spoken by fallible people like you and me, is yet God's word and attains all of his power. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We sing together our offer. Grant us, your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily believe your word 
and through the holy sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. I invite you please to rise. The Lord be
the body of Christ is given to you. Take a drink of true blood of Christ to shed for you. Here, take a drink of the body of Christ is given for you.
and blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you all in both body and soul unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace, knowing that your sins are forgiven. Amen. We sing together the new hymn.
before we get on our way. One, please do not forget we have a special voters meeting immediately following this service to talk about calling Michael as a vicar for the next year. Uh, I think we need at least 12 people. Uh, and I don't see our treasurer and I don't see our secretary. She's over there? Yes. All right, good. I was getting really worried I was going to have to answer some questions <laughs> that I didn't know how to answer. So I'm really glad she's over there. Um, so we will have that voters meeting immediately following. It should not take too long. Since it's a special voters meeting, that is the only item on the agenda. So please stay so that we make sure we actually have a quorum and can make that, uh, make that decision as a congregation. Um, next weekend, I will be leaving on Saturday. Uh, Michael doesn't know this yet, but he's got services all next weekend. Um, I've got the pastor's conference uh, in uh, the Dells, and we are heading as a family a couple days early uh, to actually spend a little bit of time. We've not, in the four years we've been here, we've never really gotten to explore the, the state a whole lot. So we're going to go up there and spend a little time as a family that weekend. Um, and then I will be gone until Wednesday afternoon for the the Spring Pastors Conference in the Dells. I'll still have my phone on me. Uh, if there's any uh, pastoral emergencies or things like that, we'll have Michael here, assuming that you vote in the affirmative today to cover those things. Um, and so, uh, but if there's anything else, that I will have my phone on me, so you're more than welcome to call me at any time. Uh, that also means that there is no Bible study today, and if Michael is doing the services because he's not ordained yet, there will be no Lord's Supper next week. So for my wife, who is on uh, Altar Guild, we'll just have to make sure that the, everything's set up before we leave, and we won't have to worry about the Lord's Supper. I just don't want that to surprise anyone. I know, I know we love meeting together and receiving the Lord's body and blood, and I love that you love that, but Michael can't quite do that yet. So, um, and that's an, an important uh, distinction to be made. If you have questions about that, please come see me, and I'll tell you why uh, that, that is the way that it is. Okay? Um, are there any announcements that I don't know about? Do yes, Nancy. Have them to take today? Oh, yes. If you would like to take your Easter lilies, by all means, uh, please do so. Um, that's that's more than fine. Although it was beautiful having them adorned, uh, I tend to kill plants. I got really lucky not killing your poinsettias at Christmas. Uh, don't push it. <laughs> come take come take your Easter lily home so that you can keep it alive. Also, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but the flaw the uh, flowers on the either side of the altar. This is our third week with those. Uh, they're beautiful, and God has kept them for, for three weeks all uh, since Palm Sunday for us. So that's pretty pretty neat that that's happened. Usually that doesn't happen. We might be able to stretch them in two weeks, but certainly not a third. So what a, what a beautiful blessing to be able to put those out three weeks in a row. Any other announcements that I have neglected and or forgotten? Wonderful. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.